Okay, the webinar has started. Um, I'll give uh, everyone time to start uh, trickling in. I see that uh, I see that they are trickling in. More and more people are going to be uh, in the participant section. So welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll get started in just a brief minute. Like I said, I'll just give time for everyone to, to trickle in. And once I see that number stop uh, stop ticking up, uh, we can get started. So um, give everyone a few more seconds. Cool. Well, um, looks like that's the first batch of people uh, everyone's been able to join. Uh, once again, thank you all for being here. My name is Kyle Homan. Uh, I am with the Arizona Commerce Authority, and today we have a webinar on the R&D Tax Credit Program. Uh, joining me today, uh, I have uh, uh, Tiffany Bisconner, Peter Firth, and Nikki Harrow. Nikki also works alongside me here at the, uh, the Commerce Authority. Uh, and before I hand it over to Tiffany and Peter, I just want to give you all a couple of uh, uh, announcements and, and upcoming events. Uh, next month, February 22nd, uh, the ACA is pleased to announce that we are partnering with uh, Raytheon Technologies uh, Missile and Defense System for a collaboration opportunity and networking session where you can learn about uh, partnering with Raytheon as a small business for through the Small Business Innovation and Research Program or the SBIR program. Uh, for more information on that, you can go to our to our website and under programs, you can find our SBIR program tab uh, and then learn more about that event through there. But that's a great opportunity for companies that are looking to uh, help uh, fund their R&D through the uh, Small Business Innovation Research Program. Uh, but of course, many of you here are here today to learn about funding your uh, research and development through the Research and Development University Tax Credit Program. So uh, before I kick it over to Tiffany and Peter, I'd like to just give a brief uh, introduction bio on both, both of them. Uh, Tiffany is a certified public accountant with over 20 years of experience in the fields of accounting and tax. Uh, she has served as the CFO for a nationwide property management company, the controller for a nationwide construction management company, the controller and operational manager of an international entertainment production company, the treasurer of a nonprofit organization, the advisor and head accountant for numerous arts-based organization, and has run the startup business into a into, has run startup businesses into thriving companies. Tiffany has worked with one of the top 10 CPA and consulting firms in the nation and is currently a partner at Asina Consulting, focusing on providing specialty tax incentive consulting services. She works with other CPA firms and directly with business owners in multiple industries at all levels of growth to help educate and, and identify opportunities for the utilization of tax credits for infusion of cash flow. And uh, whenever we introduce people, we like to uh, give a couple fun facts about them. Uh, for Tiffany, she's a three-time full-distance Ironman triathlon competitor and a two-time Boston Marathon qualifier. Um, that's pretty cool. And uh, I'm now going to introduce Peter. Uh, Peter is the co-founder of Swift Coat. Uh, he develops thin films that make more efficient solar cells, self-cleaning glass, and bandages that heal wounds faster. Uh, Swift Coat has secured $3 million in funding from the NSF and Department of Energy and a 1 million seed round and 2 million and growing in commercial projects. Uh, fun fact about Peter, on the weekend, you can either find him on a tennis court, a pickleball court, or uh, performing live music at many of uh, the Phoenix area's uh, uh, venues. Uh, so that's pretty cool about both of them. I'm super happy to have them both uh, here with us today. And I'm going to kick it over uh, to you, Tiffany. Uh, thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Um, and what I love about doing these events, and especially the personal questions, is you start identifying things of later projects. So me and Peter are definitely going to be jamming out soon. Um, but thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, it's a lot of information that I, I'm going to try to cover today as succinctly as possible. And um, from the perspective of just overview, um, I'm going to start going through some of the Arizona specific credits, uh, but also talk through where they came from. Uh, and then the idea is to kind of ground those in the what's, the differences. And then uh, we have the joy of having Peter here too, to be able to give a live example of how some of this uh, funding through the, the ACA, through the Arizona programs has actually helped to 
build his business and to create more cool things in the world. Um, so if you have questions throughout the presentations, feel free to throw those into the chat or the Q&A and um, we'll do our best to address as much as we possibly can throughout the, the conversation. So let me see if I can get this working. It's always like Russian roulette getting this thing on the right screen. So let's see. Do you see my full slides? You're good. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Um, so really what I want to start with is, is what R&D credits are. Um, a lot of you on the phone may have heard what the actual R&D credit program is at a federal level, um, but really that's the initiation of everything else that happens even at the state level. So R&D credits, the way that I usually like to present the idea to ground it in a business owner's reality is it really is focused on the things that you're doing already to stay relevant, the things that you're doing to make things better, um, the energy, the effort, the time, the cash that you spend on making something better within your business or within your industry. And that is kind of the starting place of what kind of things are you doing that qualify for R&D. Uh, when we talk about R&D, just kind of regular vernacular, a lot of times what we consider or define R&D as is different than how the IRS defines things. Um, if anybody's read IRS code, it's, it's a joy. Um, Definitely, if you ever need some reading material for bedtime. Uh, but a lot of times the way that the definitions run within the code is what you're trying to apply to your real life examples of how are you improving things? How are you making things better? Um, so from the perspective of just how long this thing has been around, at a federal level, the R&D tax credit program has actually been around for over 40 years. So it is not a new thing. Um, what ends up happening a lot of times when federal programs come down the pipeline, states will adopt or not adopt or choose kind of their own rules in general programs. Um, and I can say one of the things that I love about being here locally in Arizona is Arizona is one of the best states in the nation when it comes to return of benefit on a lot of these programs, especially the R&D program. So when you compare different states, when you compare the return on benefit as far as your, your spend and your efforts, Arizona is really a great place to do business um, for this and many other reasons. So the, the, the way that I usually frame any type of government program and um, with complete respect and joy to all of them, the idea is programs are birthed to incentivize behavior and they're birthed in a way to try to get closer to certain objectives. So from an R&D perspective, the idea is to incentivize businesses that are taking risks to do things better, because at the end of the day, that makes our nation look better in the global economy. And then even at a state level, it makes the state look better uh, when compared to other states. So there is a, 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 an aspect of the way that the rules are written to try to get you to hire people within the U.S., hire people within that certain state that you're doing R&D in. Um, and that's just kind of the, the give back in both directions. So over time, as everything else comes down through tax law, there's plenty of clarifications that happen throughout time. And one of the biggest ones from an R&D perspective happened back in 2015 when the, the PATH app was passed. And what that did is actually open up the playground for the R&D credits for more small businesses, startup businesses, where historically before that, the credit wasn't a permanent part of the code. Uh, so what would end up happening is every year, you weren't sure if it was going to be around the next year. So from a perspective of putting energy into something that you weren't sure if it was going to be able to give you benefit in the next year, a lot of people kind of foregoed the whole process of trying to get an R&D credit when you were a smaller business with less, uh, with less uh, capacity or less resources. Um, another thing that changed is back when it first started, the idea was it needed to be something that a business was doing that was new to the world, something that was patentable, uh, something that was really groundbreaking. And the way that the, the guidance has shifted throughout the years is now it really is related to your business as its own little universe. What are you trying to do that you have to figure out within your own business, even if another competitor is doing something similar or the same thing? The fact that you have to go through a process to figure out how to get it done and you may fail that's kind of the risk area that leads you to um, being qualified for R&D from an activity standpoint. Um, so the other thing that happened with the PATH Act, and I won't um, go into this too deeply, but I think it's an important note is when you talk about federal credits or any type of tax credits, 
typically what you're doing is you're getting a benefit that has to attach to something. And I'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation as well. But um, when the PATH Act passed, before that, when you got a tax credit, a federal tax credit for R&D, you needed to have income tax to be able to attach to, to make it a beneficial. So what happens in a lot of the, the space that I work and I mentor in here locally to with startups is when you're trying to put a product out into the market, when you're trying to develop something, you're going to have a leeway, you know, sometimes three to five years where you're not in revenue because you're spending money and you're trying to get grant money, you're trying to get investment to actually build the thing. So if you're not in a revenue position and you don't have tax, there's not a lot of worth in getting a tax credit if you don't have a tax liability to attach it to. So one of the changes and options that came out of the PATH Act was being able to actually elect to use that credit against payroll taxes instead. So this is usually something that is applicable with businesses that are within like the first five years of their growth cycle um, that have employees or if they're an employee themselves within their own business um, that have wages, that have payroll tax, where you can make an election to generate a tax credit. And instead of waiting until you have income tax to offset, you can elect to use it against the payroll tax. Um, again, with everything with tax, there's complexities, there's uh, scenarios that are specific to your circumstances, but really there's two basic elections from a federal perspective, income tax or payroll tax. The credit generation is similar. It's just what you end up attaching to to get benefit, which is different. Um, another important note is from a perspective of who qualifies and what industries qualify, there is no explicit exclusions from an industry perspective. It's really related to what you are doing. And that's why it's important to have conversations about spe your specific efforts in improving or making new things. Okay, so from a perspective of IRS language, and again, I'll try not to put anybody to sleep by going too in depth on code sections, but the idea is in your business, you work on certain initiatives. The IRS kind of groups those into projects. And so they like to see each project qualify through what they call a four-part test. And so the four-part test is how you qualify each of the efforts, initiatives, products, improvements, things that you're doing in order to make sure that you fit the qualification standards for actually doing R&D. So one of the first things is the, what are you doing? So a business component is what are you doing? Are you developing a new or improved product, process, formula, technique, software, or invention? The idea is that you're putting effort into discovering information that you don't already know, or you're not exactly sure how to employ. And then you have the intention of making something that is going to be for sale or used by a third party, a customer, a client. And from the perspective of that being your starting place as the what, the next thing that we kind of dive into is, okay, so what were you trying to figure out? What were your questions? Um, in all the conversations I have with business owners and innovative leaders and uh, startup businesses, existing businesses, a lot of times when you go into approaching challenges, that is kind of a given as somebody who is technical within your field that you're going to approach challenges on a daily basis. So sometimes it takes remembering, you know, what were we doing? What, what was it that we were trying to figure out? A lot of times, I mean, Peter included, right? So he has a very technical mind. He knows what he's doing. He, he dives in, he has a certain set of processes that he's going to approach. And a lot of stuff potentially gets lost because it's just what he does. So he understands that there's something that needs to get figured out. He's going to figure it out until it gets figured out. <laughs> so really the, the technical uncertainty part is then kind of parsing through what were our questions? What were we, what actually were we trying to figure out from a technical perspective? Was there a an initial thought process on how we were going to solve this problem that didn't end up going the way that we thought it would. Um, also, one of the beautiful things about innovation is there's such a marriage between the technical expertise and the creativity that goes into the strategy of developing something that it, it is that art form of just kind of unfolding and going with the information that you're getting as you go through your iterations, as you go through different sprints, as you try different things, as you experiment with one thing and it didn't go the way that you wanted. There's also a lot of scenarios where you go in to create a certain product or a certain technique of some sort, and it doesn't end up going the way you plan, but then you realize you're actually building something totally different that you didn't think you were going to be able to. So the idea is you start with questions, you go through a process of identifying different ways to address those questions. And then the fancy term is your process of experimentation is that process. 
So asking questions, looking for answers, going through either an iterative process, going through a trial and error process, a process of experimentation really is just the idea that you're trying to figure something out. So um, one of the things too that separates just general business uh, uncertainties when you're talking about how to run a business, um, how to do your marketing, things that are more related to potentially leadership, market strategy, and um, administration stuff is the scientific principles have to be embedded in your process of experimentation for it to be considered R&D from an IRS perspective. So we're talking about the computer science, which a lot of the software development is relying on elements of computer science, engineering, really any branch of engineering, um, biology, chemistry, physics, et cetera. So those are the things that need to be inherent in what you're using to figure out your questions or discover new information. Okay, and then when we talk about uh, basically when does R&D start, one of the places where I notice is, is usually the hardest to capture is the concept inception or the brainstorming that initiates your actual uh, start to a project. Um, most people I speak with, um, luckily, I get to speak with brilliant people all day long. So most of the people I speak with, their brain doesn't stop, unfortunately. Um, so the idea of coming up with ways to do things better is perpetual. It just doesn't stop. As soon as you start a project, you're already thinking about the next one, or you're thinking about how you can do this one better next time. But usually when you talk about a project or an initiative, there's going to be an initial conversation either with yourself, with your team, with a potential client that will spark an idea that will lead you down a path of trying to, again, figure out something that's new or improved in your, um, in your service line and your product lines. So the concept inception is the starting place for uh, the initiation of your R&D timeline. And that will bleed through the process of experimentation, your initial design work. Um, if you're building pr products that you're prototyping, every time you're going through a process of trying to build something to see if it works. And then the stopping point for a specific project is typically commercial production. Um, if you get to a place where you abandon a project before that point, then you still have R&D because you're actually trying to get something done that didn't end up working. And whether it's a failure or whether it's something you abandoned to focus on something else, success of the project is not necessary in order to be considered R&D. Um, so that's another thing that actually helps to support the fact that you are doing R&D. If the concept is you're trying to do something you don't know how to do and it didn't work, that supports the fact that you were reaching further potentially than either your capability or ability to design something at this point in time. Um, so from an IRS perspective, that really does support the fact that you were reaching. Um, and then again, from a, from a perspective of understanding innovation comes with its own risks internally, you're throwing money at a problem that you're not quite sure if you're going to be able to solve. Um, and when we talk about the technical uncertainties, there's three primary areas. Uh, one is your capability. So sometimes if you're doing something that you've never seen anybody in the universe ever do, you may not know if you have the capability to approach this problem in a way that would come up with a solution. It could also be, you know, it can be done. You're just not sure the best method to do it um, or the best design. So a lot of times the, the questions about design, the questions about method is gonna really be what drives the R&D process because you're trying to figure stuff out. Okay, so again, just to kind of recap, so the, the federal program is what drives all the stuff kind of throughout the, the AZ, even though there's a little bit of differences. Um, the quantification of the credit is dependent on actual hard expenses. So I get this question a lot too, because sometimes when you're in a startup phase and you're trying to build something, the blood, sweat, and tears labor goes into the initial start, right? So you're just trying skill. So at that point in time, if there's no actual cash going out the door for something, uh, you're not able to claim a credit because you're not able to generate a credit because there's no expenses to actually attach to. The moment you start spending money and you can spend money that you get from certain grants, you can spend money that you get from investors, you can self-fund if you're hiring somebody to help you with something and you start spending money towards them. So it's just an important differentiation to know that Basically, the starting place of being able to generate a credit has to come from some kind of expense because the credit itself is a percentage of those expenses 
coming back to you as some form of benefit. So the three primary categories uh, for the R&D expenses is really wages, uh, contract research, which is your 1099 folks, and then supplies and cloud hosting. So from a wage perspective, going back to my earlier comment about uh, the R&D credit being kind of a behavioral modification tool, uh, the, the federal government and also the state, they want you to hire people. They want you to bring up the wage numbers. They want you to bring people in-house. Um, so wages are typically the highest driver of the credit. Um, this is all U.S.-based. So everything I'm talking about today, there is a requirement that the spend be within the U.S., um, and that is kind of what drives, again, the initiation of this, this credit from a government perspective of wanting to keep things in-house or in-country as opposed to outsourcing. Um, if you do outsource, it doesn't throw you out of being able to take the credit. It's just that particular expense cannot get picked up. So from a wage perspective, it's, it's typically your technical folks are going to be the primary driver of R&D, but then we also are allowed to pick up direct supervision, direct support. From a contract research perspective, and we'll get into some of those nuances later as well, those are either individuals that you're hiring, say to help with development, um, some technical skill that you might not have in-house, anybody you're paying as a 1099 that's within the U.S. again. Uh, sometimes you might need a testing facility, and then as we'll talk about today, sometimes you partner with universities to be able to use the services, the skill that they have to be able to help to provide that gap in technical expertise to build the thing that you're trying to build. And then the other categories, depending on what your industry is and what the R&D project is, uh, supplies are typically if you're building actual prototypes or hard products. So your supplies are your non-depreciable items that are burned up in your process of experimentation of trying to actually build a prototype. Um, so those are your tangible expenses. The cloud hosting actually came out of the code um, as computer rental costs, because back in the day when it was written, you actually had to rent mainframe computers. Um, these days, more often than not, it's cloud hosting. So any cloud hosting costs, if you're doing development work, you're able to pick up a portion of that expense related specifically to the dev work um, that you'll be able to also include within the calc. Okay, so... This is important because I realize there is sometimes a, a verbiage difference in how people understand what deductions are and what credits are from a tax perspective. Um, again, try not to make you fall asleep, but tax deductions and tax credits are different. And really from an R&D perspective, you're taking your tax deductions, which are basic expenses that reduce your income and using those to also generate a tax credit, which is a direct reduction of the taxes that you need to pay. So deductions reduce your taxable income, which then lead you to a net figure that you attach tax to, and then credits go right after the tax. So when you talk about having a 20 grand deduction, that's just gonna reduce your top line income by 20 grand. When you talk about a 20 grand credit, that 20 grand credit is going to attack 20 grand of tax and take that away. Um, so that's kind of a simple difference there. The, again, the cool part about the R&D credits is you kind of get both out of the same thing. So you're getting a deduction based on the, the spend, the categories we just talked about. And then on top of that, you're getting a percentage back to reduce your actual taxes. The other thing that's critical for our conversation today is the difference between what does it mean to be a non-refundable credit versus a refundable tax credit. So a non-refundable credit just means that there has to be attached, uh, the tax liability has to exist to attach to in order to give you benefit. So with a non-refundable credit, if you're not paying any taxes yet, the non-refundable credit at this moment in time is not going to bring you benefit because it's just gonna carry forward until you have something to attach to that gives you value. So if you pay taxes, then uh, this is part of the word that gets a little confusing, but if you do pay taxes, if you've already paid them and you get a tax credit, you're still gonna get a refund for taxes you already paid. But again, there still has to be a tax there that you've paid that you're either getting back as a refund or offsetting with the credit so that you don't have to pay it. For a refundable credit, the idea is you're actually getting that back regardless of tax liability. So the refundable side is usually the stuff that we get most excited about because you're, you're getting that regardless of taxes that you need to pay. 
And again, Arizona is one of the best states in the nation when it comes to their refundable tax credit program, which I'll go into. But that is really, from a startup perspective, a huge gift to be able to get cash back when you're at that build phase, when you're pre-revenue or pre-taxable income. So I know I said this already, but um, Arizona Loud and Proud, uh, really great people, really great initiatives, and really great support for businesses here. Okay, so from an Arizona perspective, there is three basic arenas that you're able to claim uh, tax credits from, from an R&D perspective. Again, the stuff from a federal side is important because those qualifying factors are all relevant when it comes to what you do to generate a state level benefit as well. So the Arizona non-refundable tax credit program is what I would consider the standard program, which is you're taking very similar rules to the federal. And now on top of the federal credit that you get, you can also get an Arizona credit. Again, the non-refundable part is uh, something that you're only really getting value from if you have a tax liability or you're planning on having a tax liability. So this is usually a good option for high, high tax payers from an Arizona perspective or somebody who wants to be able to bank credits to be able to use in the future. Uh, from, an, from an Arizona perspective, you have 15 years to use those carry forwards from this standard non-refundable credit. The Arizona refundable credit <laughs> is a really, it's a, it's a really cool program. It's also a very competitive program. Um, but again, going back to what the refund means, this means that if you don't have a current year Arizona tax liability, you can generate a credit and go after the chance to get that back as cash, as opposed to carrying forward the credit. And then the university R&D is a non-refundable tax credit as well. And this is an addition to uh, one of the Arizona, the one of the Arizona tax credits. So you're not getting this in a silo. This is something that creates an additional credit on top of what you're already claiming if you're working with uh, some of the local universities here. So this one has a five-year carry forward. It's shorter than the regular non-refundable. And again, you have to have some tax to attach to, or it's not going to be valuable to you until you do. So starting with the Arizona non-refundable credit, um, again, the standard Arizona credit. So it's based on actual activities that occur within the state. So all of the things I'm going to talk about today is, is related on the Arizona side. You have to have something that's happening within the state walls. So all of the federal stuff, you can hire people outside of Arizona. If you're working with people in different states, it'll work for the federal as long as it's U.S., for Arizona, it's specific here. Who did you hire here? Who did you work with here? And those will drive your activities, expenses, and the credit. Um, the This one is less filing requirements than the other two programs I'll talk through, but basically you'll go through an R&D study, figure out which expenses count towards the credit, what activities and what projects count towards the credit. And then what you do is you basically file a tax form with your tax return to claim the credits. There's no additional steps as far as applying and trying to get any type of approval. It goes through your tax return and you just file it. Again, the carry forward for the regular non-refundable credit is 15 years. So the Arizona refundable credit is a separate program. This one I usually recommend for my clients and people interested in doing it to start this process in Q4 of the year before because the portal through the ACA will open first business day of the year. And it is a very exciting and quick 10 minutes of $5 million being gone. So it is something that you have to be prepared for. It's something that you can't sleep in for. Um, it's something that you have to be right on the dot at your computer before 8 a.m. ready to uh, jump in and enter your information. So the steps for this one are different. You actually have to apply through the ACA to be able to get uh, approval for the credits that you're requesting. So you'll go to the ACA portal. Um, again, this year it was January 3rd, 8 a.m. Uh, you log in swiftly as possible, enter information. And if you're one of the lucky ones that gets in in time, you'll receive a certification of qualification to be able to then attach to your tax return that shows how much you're actually able to get back as a refundable credit. 
Um, I can say through this process, Cindy at the ACA is absolutely amazing when it comes to communication, to helping businesses make sure that they have everything after they file in in time to be able to get the best best answer basically as possible. Um, so this has been an amazing supported project or uh, process for me throughout the years as well, um, just based on the ACA support also. So this one, the difference is you actually have maximum credit that you can claim. Not everybody's gonna get 100K maximum because it has to be related to the credits that you actually generate. So if you generate only 50 grand of credits, then you're not gonna get the 100 grand cap. But if you generate 300 grand in credits, you're basically gonna be limited to that 100 grand max. Um, the other thing that's really important to note on this one is this is best served for somebody who either has no current year Arizona tax liability or has carry forwards that take care of their current year tax liability. Because what will end up happening is when you do get that refund, uh, the credits are gonna have to offset current year tax first. And then the, the couple of downsides to, to electing this, if it's not in that most optimal scenario of not having a tax liability also, is the credits themselves will get reduced to 75%. So from the perspective of just value and timing, usually that's also something that's important to talk through. Um, if you don't anticipate being in revenue or having taxable, uh, taxable liability for a certain amount of years, this is an amazing opportunity to at least try to get some of the cash so that you can infuse your business. Um, if you think that you will, you just have to make the decision is, you know, taking 75% or if you have more than a hundred grand of credits, the additional amount will no longer carry forward. You get capped out for that year. Um, so there's just a little bit of strategy involved in what the timing of tax payments are and what your timing of benefit is. So with this one too, you'll file the same as the non-refundable on that same form with your tax return. And then you also attach that ACA certification to it as well. And this, there, there definitely is a performance element to, <laughs> to uh, getting the Arizona refundable credit. It's like a mindset thing. You got to get in there, get in there fast, make sure you have your stuff in order before the end of the year. And then um, hopefully you're lucky enough to grab it. So the university credit, as I mentioned, is a non-refundable credit. So again, this is going to be something that's going to be beneficial to you if you do have current year tax liability or anticipating one soon. Um, I would say the intention of this program is amazing because the idea is local businesses are able to connect with local universities to get stuff done that they may not be able to do in-house. And what Peter is going to talk about uh, later too is going to be his process going through this and what it was able to do for his business just with the partnership, but then also on the Arizona refundable side, being able to get some of that funding in and what that allowed them to do internally to be able to continue to develop and add that to their funding pool. Um, so the university credit is, again, it's got a couple other steps. So you're going to go through a process again from the ACA's perspective initially and get that certification of research payments. So the idea is you're needing to make sure that the payments that are going to the universities, one, they're a qualified university, um, and that you're also, you're also making payments that are under a written contract. Um, once you get that certification back, you're gonna then submit it to the, the Arizona Department of Revenue. And once you do that, and that's a snail mail situation as far as I know right now still, um, ACAs uh, come come up and most of the stuff that we submit through the ACA is going to be online, which is great. Um, so once you submit that, basically, you're able to then uh, file those with your tax return to be able to support the credit. There's another form that you file the 346 on top of the, the regular R&D form, and then you'll be able to put those through your tax return. So that's another kind of three step process. Um, so just a quick recap, uh, basically the idea with R&D credits in general is on the federal side, you're able to look back three years from the date of your tax filing to claim credits that you haven't yet. Arizona has a four-year look back, so you can look backwards to claim the non-refundable credits. Um, as I mentioned, the refundable credits are kind of an annual thing, an annual pool, and you can't go back and amend to get the refundable credits. Um, you can also use the tax uh, credits for current and future tax liability. Arizona, again, has a 15-year carry forward period, which means you could take those credits forward and use them against future tax liability for 15 years. Federal, it's a 20-year period. And then um, 
the Arizona refundable really is that, that, that one sole option in Arizona here for R&D that you can get cash back now. Okay, lots of talking. Um, I'll bring you something more exciting now, which is Peter. <laughs> um, so uh, just as a grounding point as well. Um, so what's been amazing about uh, learning more about the Swift Coat journey and Peter is, as, as a whole is they really have gone through a process where they've tried to maximize their community involvement, the resources, um, the things available to them, and then what they're what they've been building internally to um, is pretty exciting. So, um, Peter, I can share your slides if you'd like, and then unless you wanted to. No, that sounds great. I'll uh, I'll yell at you and need you to advance the slide. <laughs> you should sing at me. And yeah. <laughs> okay. a 12-step process. I mean, this is more than any of the processes I was talking about so far. So, Okay. How's that look? That looks perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for having me here today. And uh, thanks, Tiffany, for that uh, great presentation. I've been taking advantage of these tax credits for a, a long time now, and uh, I just learned a lot in that, that presentation. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to, to do today is to tell you all uh, the story about how Swiftcoat has gone from being a, a two-person company um, to, at the end of last year, signing a, a $20 million license agreement, and how that growth has been enabled by partnerships with the university, um, as well as the ecosystem of people and programs and facilities that the Commerce Authority has really grown over the last several years. So if you want to advance to the next slide, I'll give you a little bit of background about Swiftcoat. Swiftcoat's a, a nanotechnology company. Um, nanomaterials represent a really broad and exciting field of research that have applications uh, ranging from cancer treatments to textiles, uh, batteries, solar cells, advanced building materials. There's been something like a million published papers related to nanomaterials, 200,000 granted patents, and billions and billions of privately and federally funded research on the topic. However, in spite of all of that potential and all of that effort and all that money, today nanomaterials are used in less than 500 actual products. And the reason for that discontinuity is a manufacturing problem. It turns out that it's really hard to integrate something a thousand times smaller than a speck of dust into a manufacturing process that's producing a football field worth of material every 60 seconds. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, solving this problem um, and helping to unlock the potential of nanomaterials is the opportunity that I first began exploring as a graduate student at ASU, where I developed the, the core technology that would eventually become Swiftcoat. Um, today, our flagship product is a self-cleaning coating for solar panels. If you want to head to the next slide. This uh, coating uses nanomaterials that um, degrade the dirt that builds up on a panel, um, keeping it clean um, and helping the panel to produce between three and 10% more energy than today's state-of-the-art panels. You can see a picture of one of our demo units here. Uh, left side has our coating on it, right side doesn't. This module sat out in the field for about six months. You can see how much cleaner the, the left side is. Um, we uh, founded Swiftcoat with, um, about $150,000 that we won from participating in pitch competitions. Um, while we were really excited and grateful for those dollars, we found ourselves in a bit of a dilemma. Um, $150,000 wasn't enough to build the laboratory we needed. It wasn't enough to buy the equipment we needed. Um, and it wasn't enough to hire the expertise we needed. This is a very common story uh, for a lot of R&D startups. Um, it's uh, called the, the funding valley of death. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, what's uh, meant by that is that there's a lot of government funding available for early stage academic work that's typically occurring at universities. There's a lot of funding that's available to help successful ventures become more successful from uh, the, the venture capital world. There's uh, not a lot of VC funding available to help 
successful lab experiments become uh, first commercial products. It's a really tough problem to navigate, but fortunately for us, we found our way into the Commerce Authority and ASU ecosystem. Um, so those first dollars that we got from the, the pitch competitions, we used to enter into a facilities use agreement with ASU. Essentially, we were paying the university to be able to use their lab space, their equipment and their infrastructure to be able to uh, continue to make progress on our, our product. Um, being able to do that and the technical progress we were able to make in that first year um, through that facilities use agreement helped us to win an SBIR phase one award and to sign a $300,000 joint development agreement with a commercial partner. Um, it was around that time that I met uh, Jill at a conference in Austin. She told me that we should apply for the, the ACA's Innovation Challenge. Uh, we were a finalist this year, and while I'll maintain that the, the Commerce Authority made a terrible mistake by not picking us as a winner, it was actually through that process that we met the people that would become um, Swiftcoat's first investors. Um, we used those dollars to lease a 400 square foot laboratory space in an ASU owned building, which had recently been transitioned from a purely academic facility to a collaborative one where large companies like Applied Materials, smaller companies like Swiftcoat, um, and ASU researchers could all share a space, share equipment, and work together to make material science innovations. Um, and being in that environment and the technical progress we were able to make there uh, helped us to win um, close to $3 million in federal research grants from the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. Um, and then it was through our participation in the uh, Commerce Authority Venture Accelerator Program, where uh, we were introduced to the, the guest of honor today, Tiffany, um, whose company helped us to understand and take advantage of these various um, tax credits and incentives for R&D. Uh, ultimately, this resulted in a lot of extra dollars into our pockets that we use to hire new employees, um, to purchase new equipment, um, and that eventually led to us signing a, a $500,000 joint development agreement. Um, and the, the final piece of the puzzle for us was an advanced manufacturing grant from the Commerce Authority, um, which essentially subsidized our use of uh, equipment at ASU. Um, and that grant came at a, a really critical time for us. It, it really helped us to step on the gas. Um, and within six months of spending that first dollar, we were able to transition that uh, $500,000 joint development agreement into a, a $20 million license agreement with a US-based solar panel manufacturer. Um, if you were to tally up uh, the dollar value of all the incentives we've received from the, the Commerce Authority and these tax credits, it's really not like an outrageous number, um, maybe enough to support between 25 and 50 percent of, a, of a, the cost of a new hire. Um, but when you look at the, the timing of these dollars, if you look at the purpose of these dollars, and if you look at the support we received from the um, personal connections and access to resources, I can directly link those early dollars to nearly $10 million that has come into SwiftCode since. So um, if you're someone who is considering investing in a research partnership with the university, I can tell you firsthand, you're not just getting access to some of the brightest researchers in the country, and the tax credit, you're getting a partnership with an institution um, where early, that, that really understands what early stage R&D companies need to succeed. You are building a relationship with people like Jill and Kyle and Nikki and the rest of their team um, that really support research and development and understand its importance to the future of the state. Um, and you get access to their network of people like Tiffany, who can provide you with the uh, expertise and the guidance you need to succeed. Awesome. <laughs> no, I think that um, when I think the thing that excites me the most when you talk about uh, coming together, collaborating, and focusing on the heartbeat of any land in Arizona, um, we really are gifted with some amazing people that both build the economy by doing things that, like Peter is doing, putting risk, effort, thought, technical skill into making things better and doing that with the support of the community and understanding that, that the, the higher the reach, the, the harder it is to get to that ne next platform. And so those the, the bridge funding and the things that happen from an ACA perspective and a general state perspective, um, it's just been really inspiring to see how you just keep pushing forward 
and you keep building the business in a way that is allowing other people to also um, experience and learn from the process that you've gone through. So thanks so much, Peter, for sharing all of that. Um, and then uh, Nikki, did you want me to dive into some of the questions or Kyle or? Yeah, yes, so that'd be great. Yep, for sure. And I can uh, read you some of those questions. And I just want to thank you both, Tiffany and Peter, once again, for being here and sharing your thoughts and and, and all your kind words about uh, about the uh, organization and, and what we do, because we really, it really is about supporting um, small businesses like the, the ones in attendance on on commercializing those technologies. Um, as far as the, the Q&A, and feel free to keep everyone keep putting your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be happy to uh, get through all of them. Um, question from Gordon, if a customer pays you for the R&D and owns the development rights, can you still claim the credit? Awesome. Thanks for that question, Gordon. So um, this is one of the areas that keeps me up at night. And the reason why in my career and in my focus, I've dialed back to start at the beginning. So the question that you bring up brings up something that's very important within the R&D credit, which is who has the rights and who has the financial risk when you're talking about a development effort. And it's very nuanced to specific scenarios. Um, the way that I usually like to frame it is anytime you're working with somebody outside your organization, and that can be a client, or that can be somebody you hire as an independent contractor, there has to be clarity on who owns substantial rights for either the R&D work being done or the end product. And then who has the financial risk for the development effort um, sometimes those are made clear by the contracting terms. So from the perspective of, you know, a client having an idea coming to you and saying, hey, you know, I want you to build this and I'm going to, I'm going to buy it at the end as a product. There's still a case law that supports that full process of you having to come up with that product. If they're not paying you time and material to go through a process of experimentation and come up with an answer, you're getting a flat fee, say, to try to come up with that solution there's still an argument that you're at risk to come up with that end product. So from an R&D perspective, there is a chance that you would own the rights to the process of developing a product, even if the client owns the rights to the product itself. Um, so really there's a bifurcation point between the process of development and a product. So when we talk about rights, usually I'll dive into contracting terms. And again, disclaimer, I am not a lawyer, but what I look at is the tax law part of the R&D credit and see if the terminology within contracts, SOWs, agreements, if that's going to line up and hold up in an, a potential IRS audit based on who in that party has the rights, who in that party has the risk. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. And really quickly, Natalie had a quick question about uh, the, the, the uh, webinar. She asked if it was being recorded and where could you go to find it after the recording? It is being recorded. And I did answer this uh, uh, via chat, but I want to make sure that uh, everyone sees it. Uh, it is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our, uh, our SBIR uh, resources page after it's ready to be uploaded. Um, also, thank you for being here, Natalie. Um, Jim has a question. If you are pre-revenue, can you carry the tax credits forward? I think you did speak to this later on in your presentation, but I'll let you reiterate. Yeah, no problem. I'll try to do this one short. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically, again, just to uh, summarize, so from a federal perspective, you can carry forward credits 20 years, and there's actually a one-year carry back. Um, Arizona, you can carry forward the non-refundable for 15 years, uh, the non-refundable university for five years. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, uh, another question, uh, two questions from one person. Uh, number one, can LLCs funded as pass-through entities pass their tax credit on to their owners? We have a singular owner. Yes, and that's a great question. So um, S, the LLCs that are taxed as S-corps or partnerships, Anytime you have that flow through, basically you trace to where the taxpayer is, where in a pass-through entity, most of the time, it's going to be the individual owners. So really the benefit will come down to who's paying tax. Because for example, like in an S-corp, typically you're going to elect not to pay tax at the S-corp level. So where you pay the tax is where the credit actually attaches to. So again, short answer, yes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And can legal costs related to patents be used for the R&D tax credit? That's a great question. So um, there's the, a lot of tax stuff as it kind of depends. 
Um, but typically what will end up happening is if you're going through an exploratory process that involves technical evaluation to figure out if you're going to be able to uh, file a patent, approve the patent, some of that tech technical side of it. Um, technically, the writing an app without the technical evaluation part would not count. So usually I'll just talk through what was being done. Um, defending patents doesn't count. But that initial start to develop the technical language, evaluate some of the, the competency that you're going after, that would. OK, awesome. Thank you. And they also said that they've received an SBIR to conduct clinical trials in the quarter four of last year, and they're using that revenue for research. Can R&D expenses be used for that R&D tax credit? Um, yeah, I don't another know. good question. Whoever this anonymous person is, great, 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 great question. <laughs> um, so uh, again, it depends. But what I've what I've run into with SBIRs is a lot of times they're written in a way that is very taxpayer friendly. Um, you're still going to have risks to hit milestones. You're still going to have risks to figure out how to do the thing that you're supposed to do with that funding. And most of the time, the SBIRs are going to either give you rights to what it is that you're doing and or have shared rights to a certain extent. Um, anytime there's a contract involved, I just review it in advance to see if that is something that you can claim credits on. Um, as a general rule of thumb, if you're getting direct reimbursement for a specific expense from anybody that is alleviating your risk as far as the money that you have to spend to try to figure out a solution, Usually that would be something that would be harder to support as far as you having the financial risk in it. But a lot of people get grants and the amount of effort, the amount of time, the amount of expenses are going to far exceed what you're getting from that grant just to be able to satisfy the requirements. Well, awesome. Thank you for, for that, Tiffany. And thank you uh, to those great anonymous questions. Um, Jim has a question for you, Peter. Did you have any help writing your SBIR grant requests? Um, sort of. So I, we didn't like pay a service or anything to, to help us write the grant. Um, my, my business partners are professor at ASU and in general has a lot of experience with writing these types of grants. But what we found most helpful was we had uh, a company that we were friendly with that had won an SBIR award and shared their proposal with us and just being able to see like what kind of content was in there, how they explained things was, was invaluable to us. Um, I, I'm happy to share our proposal, uh, or a scrub version of the proposal anyway, with anyone who, who needs it and wants to see what a successful application looks like. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. And I'll just say the ACA does offer uh, another grant program associated with uh, getting a successful SBIR uh, proposal in. Uh, we have a $3,000 FAST grant uh, that the uh, the next uh, application window will open in February and close at the end of April. And that's a $3,000 grant associated, like I said, with getting a successful proposal in. So people typically use the, that funding that we provide to pay for a grant writer or a consultant uh, to help with the proposal writing. So we do offer funding for that. That as well. Uh, and you can learn more about that as well on our SBIR resource page on our website. Um, and I would highly recommend if you're going through that process to get help. It'll, it'll increase your chances of getting accepted tremendously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gregorio has a question. Are tax credits limited to taxable entities such as a C-Corp? Uh, nope. Yep. So those can be C corps, S corps, partnerships. It can also be single member LLC companies that are filed on your personal tax return. Um, so you you don't have a limitation here in Arizona or federally based on the type of entity. Cool. Thank you. Uh, another uh, interesting question: If some of the wages of our of the R and D team was, were already paid for by a grant, can those dollars be used again as a qualified R as qualified R and D expenses? Double double dipping. Yeah. So this is a, this is, um, I, I'm loving these questions because they really are the, the deep dive of differentiating, again, those two tiers I was talking about with that earlier question, which is who in the relationship, whenever you're getting funding, has the financial risk and who has substantial rights to what is being built. Um, a lot of times grants are basically giving you a certain amount of money if there's requirements to be able to be uh, reimbursed for certain things getting a direct reimbursement for something will likely be something that's hard for you to claim again because you didn't have any risk for that because it was reimbursed by something specifically. If you're getting a flat sum of money and you're choosing how you spend that money and you still have risk involved as far as what it is that you're developing and what you're trying to do, a lot of times 
it's, um, I know it might feel like double dipping, but really under the IRS guidelines, you still have financial risk. You still have substantial rights for what it is you're doing. And if we can prove those two things out, where you get your capital from is less relevant, but the contract or the grant terms are going to determine who can take the credit or if you can take the credit. Um, so this would be another one that we'd want to look at specifically. Thank you. Um, if you receive SBR grants or DOE grants for R&D, can you take the tax credits for spending that money on the R&D being conducted? Yeah, so this is going to tie into kind of a similar answer. Um, usually the SBIR, same thing, the way they're structured, they're going to give the taxpayer rights. So there's a possibility to be able to claim credits. Um, what we'll look at is direct reimbursement stuff. Um, the DOE grants too, a lot of times they'll do shared rights and you still have risks for hitting milestones within the requirements of that grant specifically. Um, so those are things that we can look at specifically, but it doesn't automatically disqualify you from, from picking up the expenses related to it. So there's a lot of scenarios where it would actually fit well. Cool. Awesome. Um, uh, Gordon has another question. Have you heard any updates on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that affects R&D credits in 2022? Uh, I actually have a, a, a something on this that I can share and then I'll let uh, you uh, fill any gaps I'm missing, Tiffany. Um, but uh, as far as the uh, the tax credit, the, the, that, that bill and what it did for the R&D, uh, what it did was essentially double the pot for small businesses to utilize the federal R&D tax credit from $250,000 to $500,000. Um, the way the PATH Act worked was it allowed them to use the $250,000 credit against their share of Social Security or FICA tax. Uh, and then with the uh, the additional uh, $500,000, um, it's allowing them to then um, also apply an additional $250,000 against their Medicare tax liability. Um, okay, so I want to pop in. So that's actually, I think it's an answer to a different question, but I'll explain what that answer was. <laughs> um, so, oh. <laughs> um, so basically, um, and and Gordon, we have to have a chat because you're asking all the hard questions that keep me up at night. So, um, what Kyle just mentioned is there was a bill that passed towards the end of the year that we were hoping there was going to be a fix to the R and D amortization rules that started with the TCJA, and it was not included. What they did include is something that we've been trying to also get passed for a couple of years which was an increase in the amount that businesses can take related to the payroll tax offset. So if you remember at the beginning of our conversation, I explained that on the federal side, you can elect to use uh, tax the tax credits against payroll tax after the PATH Act. What the bill that Kyle just mentioned did is increase the amount of benefit that you can get and also expanded what taxes you can attach to from a payroll perspective. Um, Gordon, I think the question that you're at, you were asking is legitimately the one that most CPAs in this space have been held awake with for years. Um, so we've been waiting for a fix to what got put into the TCJA, which would require amortization of R&D expenses, regardless of whether or not you take a tax credit, because there's classifications on how you're supposed to present R&D expenses on your tax return. There until this gets changed, the requirement is you're supposed to amortize U.S.-based uh, expenses for R&D over five years. Anything that's spent outside for foreign, foreign R&D cost is required to be amortized for 15 years. Nobody in their right mind wants this to stay. It's just, if you can imagine since 2020 and the pandemic, there's been a lot of political bickering and there hasn't been a lot of movement on getting this fixed. Um, through the AICPA, through the, the general CPA channel, we're all still anticipating there's going to be a fix. When has been the question? Um, so at this point in time, there is a very unique scenario for 2022 specific to how you can address R&D expenses on your tax return, where you used to have the choice to capitalize or expense in the current year. If this stays, it's going to force you to amortize those expenses or spread out those expenses over five years. And again, that's regardless of whether or not you take the tax credit. So today we talked a lot about tax credits. This is an actual deduction classification. Um, so yeah, and Gordon, if you want more information or dive in deeper or anybody else, please let me know, because this is really a sensitive and time sensitive topic specific to 2022 filing. Well, thank you. And yeah, the TCJ versus the IRA. I, believe me. All the acronyms <laughs> finally caught up to me. But 
I love uh, that you brought it up, and I love that you know that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, another anonymous question: How would tax credits be applied to cost sharing with industry partners? I think I need more information, anonymous, uh, just so that I make sure that I know what you mean. Um, cool. I think. It, I'm going to try. And if I'm wrong, just let me know. But I think if you're talking about going into potentially a joint venture or a project where two people are spending money on it, uh, we would have to still identify within those two parties. The IRS doesn't want two people to claim credits for the same thing. Um, so we would just have to make sure that we're identifying who kind of has the financial risk, who's that substantial rights, and which party has a right to it. Um, there's also different ways potentially to structure that partnership or connection in a way that might lead to benefit to both. Um, I just have to make sure I understand your question better. Um, if you did answer that question perfectly, if not, I'll give them time to maybe rephrase or retype it while I go over to, when is the deadline to complete an application for the PATH Act? Um, okay, um, so I think I know what you mean, but uh, so the PATH Act was something that was a, a, like a, an act that got changed and is in there. There's no application for it. If you're talking about applying for the payroll tax credit, um, then basically the rules for applying or electing a payroll tax offset as opposed to an income tax offset, that needs to be done on an originally filed return. Um, and so, for example, if you want to try to do a payroll tax offset for 2022, uh, you would have to do that before you either file a timely return, 315, 415, or before you file your extended return, um, 915, 1015. Hopefully that answers it. Cool. Awesome. And uh, Peter, it looks like uh, Jim sent you an email. Um, that is it for the Q and A box. Um, oh, one more. Does this webinar offer CPE credits? The webinar, um, the organization, maybe. Um, I'm not familiar with what a CP. Oh, it is a. Um... Oh, does it qualify for CPE hours? <laughs> um, here. Um, I don't think we set it up like that. <laughs> I've given them permission to talk if they want to verbalize their question instead of just typing. Are you a CPA? Yes, I am. Okay. I was just trying to figure out if there's a way to retroactively do it, uh, knowing that you were here, but we didn't set it up on the front end to be a CPE. Um, so I don't know if we're going to be able to meet the requirements to do it, okay. um, but I'll, I'll double check and I'll keep, if you want to send me your email, I can reach back out too. All right. Because this does qualify for tax. You talk a lot about tax stuff. Yeah, I talk, I talk a lot like in general, but yeah, this was a tax <laughs> webinar, hundred <laughs> percent. So I do a lot of CPEs uh, uh, also too. It's just, uh, usually we get more business owners, less CPAs on these type of events. So um, it didn't get set up like that. Okay, thanks. But yeah, shoot me your info and we'll, we'll, I'll see if we can figure something out. Okay. Awesome. Well, that looks like it is finally uh, through with the chat box. Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, your questions and uh, joining us here today. Thank you again to Tiffany and Peter for a great presentation and some insightful uh, answers to those questions. Uh, like And like I said, this webinar is being recorded, and we will get that up on our website uh, once it's ready uh, for uh, uh, for upload. So if you uh, want, ever want to come back and then rewatch it, you'll cert certainly be able to. Uh, and once again, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope you all have a, a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.